Barbara Bolick was a fit, experienced hiker living with her husband in the Bitterroot Valley area of southwestern Montana. The two had left a busy life to retire amongst the beauty and serenity of the National Forest in the shadow of the mountains. Barbara loved the trails, spent a great deal of time in the wilderness, and was living her dream. On the morning of July 18, 2007, she took a relative's friend hiking into the forest to show him her favorite spot. They left around 9 a.m., and several hours later, Barbara was reported missing. Her hiking companion told police that he had no idea what happened. One minute Barbara was there, and the next, she was gone. Extensive and thorough searches were conducted, but no trace of Barbara has ever been found. Her husband, Carl, was devastated by her disappearance and frustrated by the details leading up to it. Law enforcement remains puzzled and suspicious of all parties involved. The story of Barbara's disappearance is truly a bizarre one and will definitely leave you with a plethora of questions. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 102, The Disappearance of Barbara Bolick. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine a truly baffling disappearance that is an absolute head-scratcher. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders, disappearances, and other crimes. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence Podcast. The show is also on MeWe and Minds. If you're interested in supporting the show as it is a one-man operation and you'd like to get some Trace Evidence swag, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash traceevidence or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options and contact information, as well as thorough information on all episodes. To submit case suggestions, you can visit the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Barbara Bolick took a friend hiking to show him her favorite overlook. She never returned that day, and the explanation of what possibly could have happened left everyone asking questions for which there were no answers. This is episode 102, The Disappearance of Barbara Bolick. The Bitterroot Valley is approximately 96 miles north to south and stretches from the Lost Pass Trail in Idaho straight into the state of Montana where it ends near the city of Missoula in the county of Missoula, which borders the western edge of the state. At the valley's western edge in Idaho, the valley begins in a narrow expanse, growing wider and flatter as it comes to close in Missoula. The valley, bisected by the Bitterroot River, is flanked by the Bitterroot Range with its large wilderness area to the west and the Sapphire Mountains to the east, with peaks varying from 2,200 feet to up to 10,200 feet. The Bitterroot National Forest is comprised of nearly 1.6 million acres spreading from Idaho through Montana into Missoula and Ravalli counties. There are at least 44 hiking trails, running trails, and viewing trails cutting through the dense forestry, climbing the peaks, and setting in the valley. Moderate trails in the area range from 2.6 to 28.1 miles long and can ascend as high as 9,200 feet. It's a beautiful, scenic area that provides challenges from beginners to experts, rewarding hikers and runners with glorious vistas beneath the beautiful blue skies. However, The valley holds a dark secret in the shadow of the mountains, which has yet to be unraveled. Barbara Bolick loved the area. Fit and in great shape, Barbara ran nearly every day and thoroughly enjoyed hiking through the Bitterroot Valley, whose glorious wonders she could see through the windows when seated at her own kitchen table. The 55-year-old would brush her auburn hair back, look out into the valley, and feel the desire to answer its call nearly every time she sat down for a cup of coffee. Earlier in her life, 
Barbara would marry Carl Bullock, an employee of J.P. Morgan Chase, and the two would embark on a beautiful marriage together. They met in New Jersey when Carl was still in the Air Force. When they initially made the move to Montana, Barbara didn't like the area of Carl's hometown, Dillon. However, her first view of the Bitterroot Valley would forever change her opinion of Montana. According to the Missoula Independent, after 17 years of working in the grind of J.P. Morgan Chase's security operations, Carl was ready to say goodbye to his career. He and Barbara would move to the town of Corvallis in southwestern Montana. According to the 2000 census, Corvallis had a population of just 976 residents, much like the state of Montana itself, with a population of just over 1 million spread across 150,000 square miles. Corvallis was a remote and reserved location that certainly promised an escape from the chaos of more densely populated cities and states. Just as a side note here, cut me a little slack on the pronunciations of these places. I did look them up, but there are various pronunciations that can be found. Maybe it was the quiet, more laid-back lifestyle that was so appealing. Or maybe it was the beauty and pleasure of having such an amazing natural wonder almost literally in your backyard. According to Carl, when speaking to the Missoula Independent, as soon as Barbara saw the valley, she fell in love. Carl stated, quote, She said, This is the place I want to be. End quote. Whatever the draw, Barbara and Carl found themselves settling into Corvallis in 2001, and for an avid hiker, runner, and fitness driven woman like Barbara, it didn't take very long at all for her to begin memorizing and traveling the trails. Carl and Barbara had an almost picturesque life together, not to say that there was never a cross word. What married couple can truly claim that level of balance? But overall, they were happy. Carl told the Missoula Independent in 2014 that Barbara was exceedingly happy. She had begun taking pilot lessons and was excited to get her license, was in the early stages of learning to ski, and when she wasn't out in the wilderness, she and Carl would often travel on different adventures. In fact, the fall following Barbara's disappearance, the two were set to take a cruise along the Mexican Riviera. One of Barbara's favorite places came at the peak of the Bear Creek Overlook, located near the city of Victor, some 10 miles northwest of Corvallis. The trail peak had a height of 1,154 feet, which, while beautiful, kept Barbara back from the edge. Heights weren't her favorite thing in the world. It was a short drive down to the trailhead, and AllTrails.com described Bear Creek's trail as a 4.5-mile, moderately-trafficked, out-and-back trail that features wildflowers and is accessible to hikers and hikers with dogs. It lists the prime season for hiking this trail as being between March and September. Winter snows can add a greater challenge and risk in the off-season, and the trail itself is said to offer many activities. The trail was described as having multiple switchbacks, zigzag pattern trails that make ascending mountains easier, and the pines present a calm and inviting atmosphere where one can truly feel completely alone in and at peace with nature. At the peak, the view is grandiose and overwhelming. Multiple websites discussing the trail are covered with comments about how breathtaking the view truly is. One described the trail as short, an hour-long hike but that the view at the top welcomed hours and hours of viewing. Carl has said in several interviews that he used to hike the trails with Barbara, but after suffering a heart attack, he wasn't able to anymore. On her own, Barbara would map out and explore almost every trail and canyon in the area. She truly loved being out in the wild, exploring, testing her stamina, and just looking at all the great views around her. One of Barbara's favorite activities with Bear Creek Overlook besides hiking and enjoying the view herself, was to share it with others. In an interview with the Great Falls Tribune, Carl explained, quote, Anytime anyone came to visit, she'd always take them up there. The view up there is absolutely spectacular, just breathtaking, end quote. Barbara was an experienced hiker, always bringing with her a pack that included water, food, and protection against whatever she might find along the trail a 357 Magnum. While the forest was inhabited by deer, sheep, and mountain goats, it was also home to moose, black bears, and cougars. 
any experienced hiker would be prepared for the possibility of coming across a dangerous predator and armed to protect themselves. How many cases have we heard about someone vanishing in the woods, maybe abducted by someone just lying in wait? No, Barbara was a smart, strong woman. Standing just five feet tall, weighing 115 pounds, many have said she looked younger than her age of 55, and the Magnum was her great equalizer. Carl felt that, perhaps, Barbara should have worn the gun in a hip holster. He told the Great Falls Tribune, quote, I always used to kid her about packing the gun away. If she met up with a mountain lion or a bear, she wasn't going to have time to dig around and find that pistol. End quote. The presence of the gun, though, gave Carl a feeling of security, knowing that Barbara was at least protected out there on the trails, and as such, he never really worried about her hikes. Sometimes they'd last an hour or two. Sometimes Barbara would submerge herself into the forest and spend hours just taking it all in. She always came back, and Carl would often have dinner prepared for his tired and worn-out wife of 14 years. However, on the morning of July 18, 2007, she would vanish without a trace amid a whirlwind of confusion and questions. Carl's cousin, Donna Biles, was in town from California, and she brought along her 58-year-old boyfriend, Jim Raymaker. I should note, some articles describe him as the boyfriend, others describe him as a friend of the family. I did read a lot of articles about this, and for the most part, Carl, in interviews, gives me the impression that he didn't know Raymaker very well, and so I'm inclined to believe he was the boyfriend. Regardless, the two couples got along well, had a nice visit, and Barbara had brought up the possibility of bringing them up to the Overlook to see her favorite view. Donna and Jim agreed, and Barbara was excited to share her favorite spot with them. On the night of Tuesday, July 17th, the couple shared laughs and drinks. Jim and Donna agreed to take the hike the next morning. For Donna, there may have been one too many, as when that next morning came around, she woke up and was heavily feeling the effects of what several papers described as frozen drinks. Struggling to deal with the hangover, Donna decided that this was not the day for her to try and take a hike, but Jim was feeling good and certainly was still interested in seeing the view Barbara had raved about. Sometime between 8.30 and 9 a.m. on the morning of Wednesday, July 18th, Carl was awoken by Barbara, who explained that she was going to take Jim to the Overlook. Barbara was dressed in a pastel-colored shirt and tan shorts, her typical garb for a hike. As always, coming along with her would be the black backpack full of supplies and, of course, her 357 Magnum. She left behind her passport, driver's license, and $55 in loose cash. She wouldn't need any of that for the hike. Barbara brushed back her shoulder-length reddish hair and told Carl that she would see him a little later. Carl replied to his wife, telling her not to worry because he'd be taking care of dinner that night. Since Barbara was showing the overlook off, he figured she'd return by early or maybe mid-afternoon. It would all depend on how the hike went and how much Jim enjoyed looking at the view. As far as Carl was concerned, it was a completely normal day and he didn't have the slightest worry about his wife. Sadly, he had no way of knowing that this would be the last time he would ever see his wife. Throughout the morning, Carl went about his normal business. He was working on some carpentry that day, and as the hours passed, he thought little of it. Around noon, though, Donna began to grow concerned about the fact that Jim and Barbara hadn't returned yet. Carl, however, told the Missoulin, quote, I wasn't a bit concerned, end quote. Aside from the fact that Barbara was in shape, an experienced hiker and packing her gun, Carl also knew that Barbara was smart and never veered off the trail. She had no interest in finding herself lost in the vastness of the forest, and so she always stayed in an area where the trail was clearly in sight and her fear of heights kept her away from any edges, not wanting to slip and fall. Not to mention, this day wasn't about exploring the forest, but showing Jim her favorite spot. When 1.30 p.m. rolled around, though, Donna became insistent that Carl needed to call someone and have them check the trail and make sure everything was all right. Carl tried to calm Donna down and explain that they simply could be enjoying the view or maybe they got a flat tire. They'd be fine. Another hour passed and Donna had had enough. At this point, she became emphatic that Carl call someone. But before he could pick up the phone, his phone started ringing. 
Carl answered, and on the other end of the line was a woman who worked as a Forest Service law enforcement officer. The officer asked Carl if his wife's name was Barbara, and as soon as he heard that question, he became greatly concerned. After verifying his wife's identity, the officer told Carl that his wife had been reported missing. Carl was taken aback. How could she be missing? She knew the trail like the back of her hand, and if he expected anyone to get lost, it would have been Jim, not Barbara. Carl told the officer that he was getting in his car and driving over there, explaining that he would meet her at the trailhead. The whole drive over was a mixture of concern and confusion. Carl later told the Missoulin, quote, I just couldn't accept it. I just knew that she was going to show up one way or another, but it didn't happen. It still hasn't happened. End quote. On this particular morning, the road leading to the trail was blocked off as a team of Forest Service workers were working on replacing a culvert, according to the independent record. It was an ongoing project, and so the crew hadn't yet arrived for their daily work when Jim and Barbara were to have arrived. When the crew did get on site, approximately a mile away from the trail, they found two vehicles parked near the road closure sign. One belonged to Jim Ramaker, a rental for the trip, and the other was a light-colored Chevy Blazer bearing Missoula County license plates. According to the Forest Service crew, two men in their early 20s came walking down from the trail towards the blazer. The two men were described later by investigator Perry Johnson as, quote, well-tanned, average, fit young guys, end quote. In terms of their behavior, Johnson continued, quote, they walked right through the construction site. They stopped and talked for a bit, end quote. The two men spoke with the working crew, and members of the crew later stated that they had a black dog with them, thought to be a collie, and that while they talked, the dog ran down and played in the creek. The two men drove off shortly after, as the sun was rising and the temperature was getting hotter. It was mid-July in Montana. Approximately 45 minutes to an hour later, Jim Ramaker emerged from the trail, alone. Jim asked the crew if they had seen Barbara, giving a quick description of her, but they hadn't. The two had become separated up at the Outlook, and Jim couldn't find her. One of the crew members accompanied Jim back to the car to see if she was there and maybe had returned to it after getting separated, but she wasn't. According to reports, after Barbara couldn't be found, Jim walked the trail again, searching along the way and at the peak. When he came back down an hour to an hour and a half later, he told Forrest crew members that he couldn't find Barbara and he needed help. Jim would tell responding investigators that he couldn't really explain what had happened. It had been so quick. He told them that, while at the Overlook, Barbara and he had seen the two men who had come down earlier and exchanged pleasantries. When it came time to leave, he and Barbara began walking away from the Overlook. According to Jim, Barbara was approximately 20 to 30 feet away when he decided to take one last view of the scenery. This look lasted approximately 45 seconds to a minute. When he turned back, Barbara was gone. To the best of his recollection, this took place between 11.30 and 1 p.m. Jim's story was, as you'd expect, met with a lot of suspicion. Investigator Johnson felt it was hard to believe that Barbara could have just disappeared without a hint of what happened. He described the area as not being tightly wooded, at least not near the peak, and that rather than a lot of soft earth, there was a great deal of shale in the area, making it hard to imagine Barbara could have continued walking on without Jim hearing her steps crunching. Johnson later explained, quote, You'd make some noise. Just the fact that someone simply disappears like that is a cause for concern. End quote. It was certainly difficult to believe that you could glance away and then someone just disappears into thin air. At approximately 5 p.m., Law enforcement began engaging in its own search along the trail and all around the overlook. Carl arrived on the scene and spoke with investigators and searchers. He explained his wife's experience and fitness. He told them that she had walked this trail hundreds of times, kept a pack with her, and was very focused on staying on the trail. The search for Barbara was nothing short of massive. All in all, searches were conducted and participated in by Life Flight and Care Flight, Organizations which employ a ground and air crew utilizing helicopters to provide recovery, transport, and care for those in need. 
A National Guard helicopter from Maelstrom Air Force Base in Great Falls joined in alongside a helicopter from the Department of Homeland Security. At least one of these helicopters employed infrared cameras to search for body heat signatures, and ground searches included members of the National Guard, Homeland Security, U.S. Forestry Service, alongside Missoula and Ravalli County search and rescue teams, according to journalist Mike Howell. The search would last over the course of several days, with Carl being there every time. On the first day, he didn't leave the site until after midnight, at the urging of law enforcement, who encouraged him to try and get some rest. Rest would not come easy that night, or for any night in the future. In the initial hours and days of the search, law enforcement were particularly interested in both Jim's description of the disappearance as well as trying to track down and speak with the two men seen leaving the area that morning. Jim was questioned often and frequently, but his story remained the same. When asked about Jim, Investigator Johnson stated, quote, He's been cooperative and returned all of our calls. He's stayed in contact with us. Until something else happens, we find Barbara or her body. I think he's just a witness. I want to be fair to Jim Ramaker. There's no evidence he did anything to Barbara. End quote. In fact, there was no evidence that Barbara had been there at all. No footsteps, no clothing, nothing. Tracking dogs brought in from Missoula and Helena on the 22nd, Sunday, failed to pick up any scent of Barbara at the overlook nor down the cliff into the lower valley. It was almost as if she'd never been there. But five days between her disappearance and the tracking dogs could easily have caused her scent to have been lost. Ravalli County Sheriff Chris Hoffman later told reporters, quote, We have combed the area in the vicinity of the disappearance very well. No trace at all has been found. We would like to verify, if we can, that Bullock was even on the mountain that day. End quote. In terms of the two early 20s hikers, their identity remains a mystery. It was strange because the two men entered a vehicle with Missoula County plates, and so it was assumed they were local and likely to hear about the disappearance, but they never came forward to speak with investigators. On the other hand, in my research for this episode, I've come across multiple people living in the area who were completely unaware of the disappearance, which has received, at best, mild publicity. Eventually, a $10,000 reward was offered for anyone who could identify the men, but they seemed to have just vanished as much as Barbara had. Investigator Johnson later stated, quote, I don't suspect them of doing anything wrong. I don't think they were even in the wrong place at the wrong time. End quote. They are being sought specifically to verify Jim's account that Barbara was actually on the mountain that day. Search efforts for Barbara officially stopped on August 7th. 20 days after she vanished, not a trace was found. Jim wasn't the only one who came under suspicion early on. Considering the circumstances and as a matter of routine in this kind of investigation, Carl himself was questioned about his whereabouts and activities on the morning of Barbara's disappearance. This look at Carl was short-lived, though, with investigators believing that he didn't seem to exhibit the behaviors of a man who knew more about the circumstances than he was saying. In one particular encounter, Carl recalls an investigator bracing him, saying, quote, At one point, an investigator said, Well, you darn well know what happened. It kind of ticked me off, and I said, All I know is she went hiking on that Wednesday morning, and she didn't come back. End quote. For investigators, it was just a bizarre and frustrating situation. No witnesses other than Jim to confirm that Barbara had been there that day. No tracks or trails, no traces of anything. For a time, it was thought that Barbara could have fallen off a cliff or perhaps been attacked by a wild animal, but no drag marks or signs of an attack could be found, and no remains could be located at the base of the overlook. Investigator Johnson commented, quote, This whole case challenges our life experience. End quote. People don't simply disappear into thin air, and yet this seems to be a situation where, if Jim's account is to be trusted, there are only a few possibilities, and investigators have been clear. They're not ruling anything out. Outside of some kind of an accident, investigators had to consider the possibility of foul play, or that Barbara may have left of her own accord. Carl disputes that, 
saying not only was Barbara happy where she was, she never would have abandoned her cat and dog, let alone her friends and family. Not to mention, she likely wouldn't have left her money and ID behind. At the same time, the area is so vast that finding someone is like looking for a needle in a haystack. How far could Barbara have gotten, though, in the 45 seconds to one minute that Jim says he looked away? Was it possible that Barbara ended up somewhere else, and then the trail story was just a cover-up? That's hard to say, but considering that Jim's car was at the road closure when the working crew arrived for their job that morning, it leaves a very small window of opportunity if he was involved in foul play. According to Sheriff Hoffman, Jim was considered a person of interest early on, but over time they, quote, for the most part, ruled him out, end quote. Carl is, perhaps, less accepting of his probable innocence. While he has no interest in accusing Jim of anything, he did express frustration to the Missoula Independent that Jim was never brought down to the station and given a polygraph test. Jim and Donna left Montana, returning to California as they had planned for their trip. However, Carl has specified that while Jim was not given a polygraph, he did volunteer to take one. The Ravalli County Sheriff's Office simply didn't take him up on that offer. Carl went on to explain, quote, I think they could have done more with him early on, before he had the opportunity to get in touch with a lawyer. End quote. After Donna and Jim left, they maintained contact with law enforcement, and Donna kept in touch with Carl. Donna called for several weeks asking if there was any new information, but eventually Carl got frustrated and stopped speaking to Donna and Jim. Apparently, Donna had suggested to a family member the possibility that Barbara may have taken her own life, and Carl simply didn't want to hear that. Her disappearance, in his words, broke up the family relationship. Later, when reporters reached out to Donna, she again asked if there were any updates and said the situation was extremely frustrating. Jim maintained his story that Barbara just vanished, and he never laid a hand on her. Jim told the Missoula Independent that it's been difficult for him as well, he empathizes with the family, but being a person of interest took a toll on him. He explained, quote, I've had a cloud over my head since 2007, end quote. There have been few, if any, developments in the case over the past 13 years. For the most part, everything remains a mystery. The two men seen at the trail that day remain unidentified. The fate of Barbara Bullock remains unknown. In July of 2010, Skeletal remains were found at the north flank of St. Mary Peak, above the city of Stevensville. This is just 10 or so miles north of the location from which Barbara vanished. At the site, a partial skull and longer bone were recovered along with some articles of clothing. The clothing find was slim, the sole of a boot and the tag from a pair of jeans. According to investigators, nothing found at the scene matched what Barbara was known to have been wearing at the time of her disappearance. This, however, isn't exactly a rarity. Remains have been found in the wooded and desolate areas of Montana quite a bit. However, Investigator Johnson did specify that they believe these remains were those of a male. They did think it was odd, though, that no one reported finding any abandoned vehicles in any of the park parking lots at that time. Despite the mystery of this case, it's still fairly uncovered. There haven't been many national pieces about it, mostly all stories were done in local or state papers, and for the most part, they share a lot of the same information. David Politis, the author and investigator behind the Missing 411 books, many of which focus on national park disappearances, was asked about Barbara's case on Twitter in January of 2019. He replied, quote, I know the case extremely well. I actually interviewed the man she was with. It's probably six or seven years ago. Some people believe it's pure criminal. I haven't formed an opinion. End quote. There are three basic theories we'll discuss in the second half of this episode. One theory revolves around the possibility that Barbara may have had an accident or been attacked by an animal. Another theory brings Jim Raymaker into the light, questioning whether or not he has told the truth of what happened that morning. One final theory explores the possibility that Barbara's disappearance itself could have been concocted to cover up a crime involving her husband and perhaps his cousin and Jim. 
Barbara Bullock has been missing since July 17, 2007. According to her page on The Charlie Project, at the time of her disappearance, Barbara was described as a white female standing 5 feet tall and weighing 115 pounds. Barbara has red hair, brown eyes, and her ears are pierced. She also wore eyeglasses. When last seen, she was wearing tan-colored hiking shorts and a pastel-colored shirt. Police are actively seeking the two men who were seen exiting the trail that day, one of which has had an artist composite sketch drawn up of him. The men are not considered suspects and instead are being sought in order to clarify details of Barbara's time on the mountain that day. In the years since Barbara's disappearance, it's been hard on the family. Carl was shattered by the disappearance and struggled to try and understand the circumstances. It was hard to rationalize the story Jim told, difficult to accept that his fit and experienced wife could simply get lost or just plain straight vanish from a trail she had been on hundreds of times, if not thousands. When speaking to the Independent Record, Carl stated, quote, None of it makes any sense. She was only 20 feet away. That's not that far. End quote. 20 feet away and gone into thin air. It's a truly haunting disappearance, made only more solemn knowing that Barbara may have vanished from the very place she treasured the most. I have a feeling I might know what you're thinking. Probably similar to what I've been thinking. This story doesn't make any sense, and there's no way this is anything other than foul play. That's at least what I was thinking when I started researching the case. The story about Barbara's disappearance just doesn't make any sense, like Carl said. How does someone vanish 20 feet away in the middle of a national forest? There were no screams, no sounds of footsteps, no signs of any animals, no blood or clothing found, nothing. We know that people don't just vanish. That just doesn't happen. So what went on here? Was it foul play? Was it something else that is yet to be considered? It's truly one of the more baffling disappearances I've ever covered. But at the heart of this case is a woman, Barbara Bolick. Bright, driven, focused, and loving. She had a life that she enjoyed, lived in an area that excited her spirit, and spent her days exploring the very wilderness that had so easily captured her heart. Thirteen years ago, she left home to do what she did almost every day, but she never returned. In the wake of her disappearance, multiple law enforcement departments have been left astounded by the utter lack of evidence and developments. Her family has struggled to accept the reality that she may not be coming home. Losing a loved one can be absolutely debilitating. Losing a loved one with no explanation, no answers, and nothing to bury or lay to rest can be unbearable. Yet it happens, and while people often imagine that it can't happen to them, I'd assume Barbara believed the very same thing. So what did happen here? We've got one theory about an accident or animal attack. It makes sense. We're talking about slopes and cliffs, maybe even brush-covered crags and edges that could sneak up on you. If the area is covered in soft shale, there could have been some slippage or loose ground to make a fall more likely. The problem, though, revolves around two basic details. Barbara knew this trail like the back of her hand, and she stood back from edges because of her fear of heights. She stayed on the trail. She knew her way around. So how does she vanish in less than one minute? There doesn't seem to be any logic here. Sometimes things happen that defy rational thought, but in this case, it's really difficult to swallow. Imagine that Barbara did slip and fall, get injured, unconscious maybe. How could hundreds of searchers pour over this area and not see anything to suggest that? No shoe marks, no disturbed rocks or brush, nothing to suggest that it could have been a slip and fall. Not to mention, no remains found at the bottom of the overlook down in the valley. I suppose it's possible. I've read accounts of people falling and not having time to call out or hitting their head and quickly being knocked unconscious, but that doesn't explain the lack of discovery. Not to mention, if Jim knew where Barbara was standing when he looked away, they should have been able to narrow that disappearance area down to maybe 10 or a 20-foot circumference, and yet they've never found even a shred of evidence that she walked on the mountain trail at all that day. 
Maybe that's part of what makes it so bizarre. I'm not much of a hiker, but I live in an area with several national parks. Anytime I've been on the trails, I've known the dangers and certainly seen risky areas, but none that I could imagine just swallowing a person whole without leaving something behind, be it tracks or even bone. What about an animal attack? That happens. The forests and parks are dense and home to all kinds of wildlife. Certainly a bear, or maybe more likely a mountain lion, could have been stalking the two and chose to strike when Jim turned his back. You ever see that video of the tiger stalking that woman through the glass at the zoo? As soon as she turns, it leaps at her. Well, mountain lions certainly have that kind of behavior. I've been stalked by a mountain lion, and it's one of the scariest things I've ever encountered. And this wasn't deep in the forest, but along a roadside near a wooded area. At any moment, it could have jumped out at me, and I'd have been done for. However, there's a problem with this theory. Had Barbara been alone, I could see an animal attacking and dragging her away. But she wasn't. Maybe the animal waited to strike when Jim wasn't looking, but wouldn't he have heard something? The animal's paws crashing down on the shale, Barbara screaming. Maybe the mountain lion or bear could have swiped at her and knocked her immediately unconscious, making her not scream. But wouldn't there have been drag marks, blood, something to indicate that this is what happened? Not to mention, the animal isn't going to eat her backpack and clothes to the point that nothing is ever found, let alone the 357 Magnum. If Jim turned his back and began looking for Barbara, wouldn't he have noticed her being dragged away? I'm not saying an animal attack is impossible, but it does seem pretty improbable given what we know. When it comes to an accident or animal attack, there's certainly a possibility, just not a lot of evidence to support either, if any evidence at all. We can't rule them out, but we definitely don't have enough to latch on to them and say that's the most likely scenario. Just for the record, mountain lions, panthers, pumas, they're all cougars. In the past 100 years in North America, there have been only 125 documented mountain lion attacks on humans. Of those 125, 27 were fatal. Now, surely there could be undocumented attacks, but even if the number doubled to, say, 250 attacks, that still leaves a less than 0.1% chance of being attacked by a mountain lion. In terms of bears, there are more than 750,000 bears in North America, and they kill less than one person per year, on average. Out of 750,000 bears, that's a really low kill count. Murder statistics, by the way, show that about one person of every 16,000 will commit a murder each year. So, accident, animal attack, possible, but seemingly unlikely. If it wasn't an accident or animal attack, could it have been some form of foul play? Well, if that's the case, then Jim Ramaker is certainly an interesting person to take a look at. He was the last person who claimed to be in Barbara's company, and if nothing else, that makes him a direct witness to whatever could have happened, whether or not he actually saw it. According to Jim, Barbara was 20 to 30 feet away from him. He looked away for between 45 seconds and one minute. When he turned back, Barbara was gone without a trace. Jim claims to have blown a whistle, called out her name, and searched the overlook and full length of the trail twice. At no point did he find anything to indicate where Barbara could have gone. Obviously, a lot of people have considered that Jim may have played a role in Barbara's disappearance. There's really two lines of thought here. Either he premeditated an attack, or it could have been a spur-of-the-moment kind of thing. If it was premeditated, some believe that it could have happened before they even arrived at the trail, which might explain why no trace of Barbara was ever found. Imagine for a moment, Jim gets his hand on the 357 Magnum in Barbara's bag. From that point on, she'd be at his mercy. This is, of course, assuming that he even knew it was there. Also, all indications seem to suggest they took Jim's rental car out to the trail that day, so it's possible he was driving, which would have made this even more difficult. But what if he did get the gun, or something else, and had Barbara drive him elsewhere, at which point, something happened. Then he drives to the trail, walks into the woods, waits a while, and comes out saying, oh my god, she disappeared. 
It seems logical enough, but there are a couple of issues with it. Firstly, the time frame is pretty tight. We don't know what time the Forest Service workers arrived, and trust me, it's very frustrating that that's not in any article I read about this case, but we do know that Jim's car was already parked there. It's also mentioned that the two hikers who left that day as the day was getting started and starting to get warmer would suggest that it had to have been at the latest early afternoon. We know Barbara and Jim left the house between 8.30 and 9 a.m., The drive to the trail was approximately 13 minutes long. So if they left at 9, they'd be in that area by, say, 9.15. I can't guarantee this, but I can't imagine the forest workers showing up later than 10. Maybe 11 if we're being lenient. They had the road shut down leading to the trail, so I doubt they'd have left it like that for hours and hours all morning. But stranger things have happened. The only timeline we have to work with following them leaving the house is Jim's. Jim claims Barbara disappeared between 11.30 and 1 p.m. I guess he wasn't wearing a watch that day. We all know the trail itself had a length of 2.6 miles, which has been described as an easy trail, to the end and back taking approximately one to one and a half hours. This means that walking one way would be between 30 and 45 minutes. If, at the latest, Barbara disappeared around 1 p.m. and Jim spent, say, 30 minutes looking before taking the trail back down, the latest he'd have emerged from the woods would have been approximately 2.15. Remember, Carl received a call that Barbara was missing between 2 and 2.30. Jim went back on the trail to search again and returned 45 minutes to an hour later, which seems to confirm the time it takes to walk that trail, but contrast with Jim being able to come out of the woods at 2.15. He'd have had to have come out earlier if this was the case. This would mean if Barbara disappeared between 11.30 and 1, depending on stops along the trail, they could have arrived at the site as early as 9.15 a.m., walked up the trail, say, taking an hour. Now it's 10.15. Something goes wrong up there. Foul play or something else occurs. This buys Jim between 10.15 and 2-ish to cover it up and come up with the story. That's almost four hours. If you start the clock from when they left the house around 9 a.m., then Jim has the potential of being alone with Barbara for four to five hours. Just for the sake of argument, on the low end, let's say they got to the peak around 10.15 and Barbara disappeared at 11.30. Jim looks around for a few minutes and then heads back down the trail. At the earliest, he'd arrive down near the forest crew at approximately 12.15. That means from 9 a.m. to 12.15, Jim is the only person to see Barbara. That's just over three hours. A lot of things could have happened during that time, and while we have no evidence one way or another, it's certainly possible that something could have happened quickly along the way, or perhaps on the mountain itself. The problem I have with the mountain is the lack of any evidence. I suppose Jim could have tried to cover up drag marks or blood, but he's not going to be able to hide a body from the searchers and helicopters with infrared. To me, if Jim was involved, it had to have happened somewhere else. The time frame is tight. So it couldn't have been something complicated. It would have had to have been pretty quick. Given the fact that I assume investigators looked at his car and found nothing, it would have had to have happened outside of the car. Maybe Jim pulls over in a remote area, pulls Barbara out, and does something. How she wouldn't have been found by now, though, is difficult to accept unless it was in an area as dense and difficult to search as the Overlook itself. I don't know, Jim. Maybe he's not very bright. But if you killed someone and needed to make up a cover story, let's face it, this cover story sucks. Would have been smarter to say, she was going to go hike some more, I was tired, she told me to head back down and I did, but she never came back. He could have walked back down, hung out by the car, spoken to the forest workers, created an alibi, and then told him he was concerned because his hiking partner hadn't come out of the woods yet. But if you're panicking and worried and your adrenaline is pumping, Maybe you aren't thinking that clearly. Regardless, this is either the dumbest cover story I've ever heard or so bizarre that it has to be true. Maybe that doesn't make sense, but I think you know what I mean. What do you think? Could Jim have done something beyond what he told authorities? I don't think we can say no with any certainty, nor can we say yes. One thing I read, I think it was on Web Sleuths, that caught my attention was Donna's behavior. 
Remember how when they had been gone that day, she was concerned by noon, upset by one, and emphatic by two? Did maybe Donna have a reason to be concerned? I've read two angles about that. Maybe Donna suspected that Jim was attracted to Barbara and thought something might happen. Maybe Donna had a reason to be concerned about Barbara's safety in Jim's presence, and that's why she was upset. A third option, which I didn't see anyone mention, was maybe Donna just has bad anxiety. I don't know the status of the relationship between Donna and Jim, but I'd imagine she'd have said something by now if she suspected it. Unless, of course, she's the type who is willing to cover for her partner. I do think it's weird that she allegedly suggested Barbara may have committed suicide. Who decides to commit suicide by bringing a basic stranger along with them? Not to mention, I doubt she'd have committed suicide and been super concerned about her remains not being found so well that she hid them somehow. I don't know about Jim. Ultimately, his story bothers me. The fact that he and Donna kind of drifted away from Carl bothers me. Frankly, the whole thing bothers me. But I've got nothing to work with here. Police have nothing to work with here. You've got only one witness, and it's the guy who could have been involved if a crime took place. The fact of the matter is, without more evidence, some kind of a confession or some new lead, Jim's involvement or lack thereof remains in the ether. He hasn't since been arrested for any violent crimes, though, so it would seem weird to me that he would do this just once. Also, there were no reports of him being bruised, scratched, or anything else which would suggest a struggle between him and Barbara. So if it wasn't an accident, animal attack, or Jim, what does that leave? Well, Carl got looked at initially. Everything we know about this case comes from three people, Donna, Jim, and Carl. Some have suggested the possibility that something could have happened to Barbara either before she left with Jim or maybe the night before. We know the drinks were flowing. What if something went wrong? Whether it was the result of an altercation or even an accident, this would be an interesting way to cover it up. Of course, there's probably easier ways to cover up a death than to make up this bizarre hiking disappearance story. It's hard to explore this possibility because it could have been almost anything. Maybe severing the connection between Carl and the others was a purposeful thing, to distance them, to create an air of disagreement if for no reason other than making things seem less suspicious. It's all hard to say. I've wondered about the possibility of Jim and the car being dropped off near the trailhead early in the morning, and then taking Barbara elsewhere to give Jim the ability to come out of the woods and look less suspicious while Barbara's being disposed of in a different location. Of course, we also know that Carl was home when the Forest Service officer called sometime between 2 and 3. I mean, that does leave a lot of time, especially if something happened the night before. Unfortunately, we've got no evidence here, and Carl didn't exactly behave like someone with something to hide. He participated in searches, did interviews, pushed for more work, and to this day remains in contact with law enforcement. Not to mention his previous talk of a heart attack, making him unable to hike anymore, it seems unlikely he was in the physical shape to take on someone like Barbara, who was fit and active. However, I guess that doesn't rule out the possibility of an accident. I'm a believer, though, that if any combination of these three knew more than they were saying, someone probably would have broken by now, leaked something, called in a tip. You know the old saying, three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. This would be a very difficult secret to keep especially with friends, family, reporters, and law enforcement asking a lot of questions. There is, of course, a fourth possibility. Many people have looked at the two hikers seen that day and wondered if they could have been involved in some way. It is bizarre that they've never come forward. You'd imagine if you were hiking in that area, saw a man and a woman, and then later heard that a woman disappeared, you might want to provide what information you had. While multiple times throughout the episode, I said that these two were being sought merely to give their account of the day. I find it difficult to believe that they aren't being looked at as potential persons of interest. They were apparently driving a Chevy Blazer. A lot of space in that vehicle. Plenty to hide a body or perhaps even a live person who is unconscious or bound and restrained. However, if Jim's story is true, how did they get her in their hands without him hearing something? Without him seeing something? We know that the two men came out of the woods approximately 45 minutes to an hour before Jim did. This wouldn't have left them a ton of time. Plus, wouldn't they have had to have done something to Barbara, then either brought her to the car and went back into the woods to emerge later, 
or have put her somewhere else in the forest where she was never found. Both of these scenarios seem unlikely, but almost all of the scenarios in this case seem unlikely. It just bothers me that they've never come forward. But there's also the possibility that they were visiting from out of town and drove a blazer with Missoula County plates because they borrowed it. Then, maybe they wouldn't have heard the story and known that they could possess information that could all be critical to this case. All in all, their involvement or lack thereof seems suspect, at least when you compare it to Jim's. We know they existed because the forest crew workers saw them. Whether or not they saw Jim or Barbara remains unknown. Also, what's the likelihood that they planned this? Probably slim unless they were specifically following Barbara to begin with, and we have no indication that they were. So what, they saw this woman in the woods and just thought, let's grab and or kill her for no reason? Stranger things have happened, but this story seems very hard to swallow. Again, how the hell would Jim not have noticed? Not to mention when these two hikers came out of the woods, they hung around, they talked to the forest workers, they let their dog play in a creek. These don't seem like people who are urgent to get out of there. I have to agree with Carl, none of this makes sense. There's various other theories. A wandering mountain man took Barbara. She ran off on her own. She took her own life. I think these are, at best, fringe theories with nothing at all to support them. The sad truth is, Barbara Bullock vanished on the morning of July 18, 2007, and has never been seen again. Her family and friends wonder what could have become of her. Could she still be alive, or will they never know? Law enforcement keeps the case open, but have the same information to work with as they had the day it happened 13 years ago. Sadly, short of a confession, some major break in the case, or the discovery of Barbara herself, this case will remain open unsolved, and growing colder by the day. If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Barbara Bullock, there are many websites and news articles available. The Charlie Project has a page for her, as does NamUs. I will, as always, post all sources in my links on the website. If you have any information about the disappearance of Barbara Bullock or the two men seen leaving near the trail that day in a Chevy Blazer, please contact the Ravalli County Sheriff's Office at 406-375-4009 or 406-375-4055. You can also call their after-hours number at 406-363-30. 33 or you can contact Crime Stoppers at 406-363-0062. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, tag me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or comment in the Facebook group. A lot of you have been contacting me about a potential job opening as a researcher on Trace Evidence. If you're still interested in that job opening, visit trace-evidence.com slash careers. There's plenty of information there about what the job would entail, which it'll probably entail more than I've listed there, but it'll give you a general idea. Everything you need to know about how to apply for that position is also listed there, so I look forward to reading your emails. A quick reminder about the contest I'm currently running. If you share episode 100, the investigation into the death of Kurt Cobain, on social media and tag me or Trace Evidence, you receive one entry into the contest with a maximum of five entries per account. The winner of the contest will be selected at random, so the more shares, the better your chance of winning. The prize is, of course, my personal copy of episode 100 script with all of my notes and adjustments. The contest ends at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time on January 31st, 2020. One final note. Are you planning to attend CrimeCon this year in Orlando? If you are and you haven't yet purchased your ticket, you can use the promo code TRACE2020 to get 10% off today. I'm going to be there on Podcast Row representing Trace Evidence, and I would love to see you there. So, when purchasing your tickets, use promo code TRACE2020 
and I look forward to seeing you. It's time to thank our Patreon producers. Special shout out to Tara Doble, Alicia Lorraine, Angie Dodd, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Krista Colvin, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Emily Smith, Emma Vachon, Gerard Lopez Barbosa, Jessica, Laura Dickinson, Linda Halcrow, Nick Mohar Schurz, Megan Cotter, Quinn McBreen, Randy Wyland, Robbie Blue, Tom Archer, and Tracy Woods. If you think your name should be on this list but it's not, please contact me as Patreon is often terrible at organizing the lists properly. That's going to do it for this episode. I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.